You're much more awake than I expected. Bravo, Vancouver. I'm very proud of you. My name is Moises. I'm here for our, our third day, our final day of Fan Expo Vancouver. How many of you have been here all weekend? I love all of you, but I love everyone with their hand raised more than everybody else in here. Uh, we've got a really wonderful, wonderful way to kick off the day. How many of you have actually gotten to see the Magnificent Kevin Conroy live before? Okay, how many of you have never seen this guy on a stage before? You are the luckiest people in the room, and that's most of the people in the room. This is going to go really, really well. We've already got some people up at the Q&A microphones. Uh, if you get up to the Q&A microphone and need to adjust it, you can step on the leg of it that's right in front of you and crank it up and down as you need to. Uh, I'm going to start things off asking you a few questions, then we're going to turn it over to you, the audience. Uh, so bring your best, best questions. Now, uh, those of you who have come to one of our Q&As so far this weekend know that I, I need your help to get our talent out onto the stage. Do you think that you have the right level of energy to, to blow the roof off this place and bring Batman out? I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced. Can we try one more time? Just... Okay, that feels about right. So ladies and gentlemen, there have been Batman before him, Batman after him, but there's only one Batman. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Conroy. these people showed up hey, early everybody. on a Sunday thank morning Thank you for you. coming so early. I appreciate that. Thank you. Now, Kevin, we, uh, we recently crossed the 25th anniversary mark with Batman the Animated yeah. Series. We have a beautiful new Blu-ray restoration of it that's coming out uh, at the end of this month, even, even up here in Canada. Uh, for once, Canada is not getting the delay that often happens when we have U.S. releases of things. Uh, yeah, there'll be a Blu-ray release uh, at the end of the month, October 31st. And it has the entire, uh, all the shows we did, including uh, Mask of the Phantasm and Sub-Zero. And there's a really interesting uh, B-reel uh, that's included in it of interviews with all the cast and the creators of the show, um, which is, I think, 90 minutes long. It's a big B-reel. So it's really worth getting. Now, you've done a bunch of these conventions with your castmates, uh, with people that you did many, many, many episodes of the show with, like Lauren Lester, yep. uh, people who were guest stars, uh, you know, playing Batman villains we love, like, uh, like Poison Ivy and so on. <laughs> uh, have, you, have you found that your relationship, going back to when you were recording, uh, to now, having done these conventions with so many of your castmates, that, that you found some of those relationships have become deeper and, and even more meaningful friendships than they were as, as co-workers? Well, the, the interesting thing about doing the show was the, uh, the casting of the show. It's a, you're touching on a really interesting aspect of it. And Andrea Romano, you may know her name, she was the casting director. Uh, she's a very talented woman. I mean, uh, we, we could and, list uh, off her, her credits, but I mean, Animaniacs, Tiny Toon Adventures, mm -hmm. Uh, I think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yeah, every, at one point. I mean, everything. Everything. Andrea is like the go-to casting person, and she um, just casts people who, who not only are wonderful actors, but who work well together, you know, who are generous. And um, so every booking was just a, a real joy to go to. And it, the word kind of got out quickly that it was a really fun show to do, the first one, Batman the Animated Series. And it established a reputation among actors. So she said she had no trouble getting people in at all. Everyone wanted to do this show. And then, um, you're right, now as Comic-Cons have taken off, uh, you get a chance to spend more time socially with a lot of these actors that I worked with over the years. And, um, you know, people like Mark Hamill. I mean, he's just such a great guy. He's such a great guy. I mean, aside from being the best Joker, you know, he's the definitive Joker. He's, he's a wonderful, generous guy. You, you watch him watching other actors. I wish you could see him in the booth watching the other actors. He's like this. He looks like he's 12, and he's like looking at his favorite toy. You know what I mean? He gets such joy from the other actors. Um, so there's none of that kind of jealousy that a lot of creative people can have. Um, and so he's just... He, I love that he loves when I'm doing well, and I feel that warmth, and I give it back to him, you know, so there's this creative energy in the room. 
Um, and the same was true with the other actors, like Ron Perlman um, was involved with the show, wonderful actor. Yeah, Ron was here yesterday he and, was here. And, and gave some, some really wonderful love to Andrea and, and how uh, her having been a fan of his from Beauty and the Beast yeah. translated to him getting some work when things are a little bit slower for him and getting to work with that magnificent ensemble. Yeah. So it was, just, it was just an amazing group of actors. John Glover and uh, Roddy McDowell and Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. and Adrian Barbeau and Tara Strong. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. You mentioned Mark. I, I, I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up that when, when he came to the show, he, he, he ended up replacing someone as the Joker. Yeah. Uh, but he also kind of came in as the arch fanboy of the universe. Yeah. I mean, he, he was kind of your encyclopedia of reference. Mark is a maven about anything animation, and I wasn't. I didn't really know a lot about animation when I got involved. It was the first animated character I ever auditioned for. That doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And, um, you know, it's like getting the brass ring. People always ask me, what other, what other character would you like, what other superhero would you like to do now? And I say, where do you go after Batman? <laughs> I mean, he's the coolest superhero, isn't he? Because he has no superpowers. He's just a guy who's been wronged by life, and rather than letting it crush him, he overcomes adversity, and he makes himself into this force of good. I mean, everything about him is so noble, is so inspiring. So it's, but underneath it all, he's that damaged, damaged person so there's so much to play for an actor. There are so many colors, so many levels, that it's just, for an actor, it's like, it's like a, a, it's a dream come true. It's a wonderful role to play. So, um, and then to play that role with all those other wonderful actors, because the secret weapon of the whole series, of all the series, Justice League and um, uh, Batman Beyond and all the different incarnations are the villains. The villains are amazing. They're just the best villains. And, um, you know, you mentioned uh, the Joker, who's incredible. But there's, you know, Two-Face and Sub-Zero, uh, Mr. Freeze, and, I mean, Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn. And, I mean, they're just, they're all just out there, you know? I mean, you guys had this amazing troupe of actors that were playing these parts. I mean, Paul Williams, for crying out loud, is the Penguin. I know. Uh, you know, the, so many of these roles that, that people thought of as cartoony and silly and ridiculous and that sort of thing, uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of people ask you if you have a favorite episode, if you have a favorite one of the movies that you did. But I, I would see maybe a, a different twist on that, that that might be a little bit easier for you to answer. Do you, do you have one that emotionally, that, that, was, that was the most rewarding journey for you, uh, that really went deep. The, the, the wonderful thing about playing the character, I, I touched on that earlier, is the, um, the drama of him, the, the psychology of him. It's what actors like to have something to sink their teeth into. And when, when I went into the audition, it was a cold audition. I'd never auditioned for an animated role. But I'd, you know, I'd been on Broadway, off-Broadway, I'd been acting for years. I've been acting since I was 17. Uh, went to Juilliard, um, I have a real strong theater background. And I happened to be in LA uh, shooting uh, an, a pilot for a series, and my agent said, go over to Warner Brothers, they're putting together this new animated show, Batman, give it a shot. And I was so naive, I didn't even know Batman had never been an animated show. I said, Batman, that's been around forever, that's not new. And he said, no, it's never been animated. So I went in and I met Bruce Timm and Eric Rudomsky and Andrea Romano. And I was meeting this like gold team of creators and I didn't know who any of them were. So I didn't have any kind of tension. I didn't have any apprehension. And Bruce Timm says, so what, what, what is your exposure to Batman? What do you know about him? I said, well, I know the Adam West show from the 60s. And he said, no, no, no. He said, we love Adam, but that's not what we're doing. He said, um, didn't you read comic books when you were a kid? And I said, not really. He said, what kind of childhood did you have? <laughs> very Dickensian. I said, very, very, very rough, very rough. So he said, no, it's... You know, his parents died when he was a child. He, he witnessed them murdered in front of him and he's avenging their deaths and he lives in the dark and he's, it's, you know, he lives in a cave and no one knows it's a, it's a disguised identity and he, 
he, he, I said, you're, you're telling the Hamlet story. I said, this is a classic story. So I just used my imagination in the booth to kind of put myself in that situation. And as I thought more and more about the darkness of what he had witnessed as a child, my voice just went to this place. And the sound started coming out. And I started making this sound. And I looked up and I looked in the booth and I saw everyone stop. And then I saw everyone move around really fast. And I thought, okay, I either really hit the nail on the head or I suck. It was one extreme or the other. You know, there was no in middle ground. So they hired me that day, it was great. But they had seen over 500 people. And that was just, it was just a very lucky choice that I happened to make. Acting's all about choices. You can play the same line a dozen different ways. You can say I love you a dozen different ways. On the page it says I love you. But you can say, you know, I love you! Or you can say I love you. I mean, it's all about the context and about the way the character is being interpreted. You can say it as a lie. I love you. <laughs> you know, not mean a, a word of it. So, it's all about choices. And I bet there are a dozen actors who could have approached the role just as well as I did. I just happened to make the right choice that day. Um, and I'm, it was just a very lucky day for me that I made that right choice. Yeah, there's so many actors who play Batman in a movie and they get, you know, that, that one shot at it. And you yeah. really have gotten this full five-act Shakespearean long-form approach to the character. I, I've, I've got to ask about another co-star of yours as you moved into the Justice League uh, side of things, uh, a, a, an actress uh, par excellence who gave voice to Wonder Woman for the first time in animation, Susan Eisenberg. Yeah. Uh, now, Susan Eisenberg? Yes. <laughs> you're, allowed, you're allowed to applaud for, for Susan Eisenberg. I think it's wonderful that the fans have gotten to see Wonder Woman in live action, but for, for so long, after Linda Carter did the live action TV show, I mean, Susan really was carrying that torch for a while. What, uh -huh. what was it like working opposite her? Because you guys were, were still doing group recordings when you, when you got to the point of making Justice yeah. League, yeah? Yeah, the great thing about uh, animation at Warner Brothers um, is that they really insist on getting everyone together. Uh, they try to get the cast together. And you do a, what's called a group record. So you're in a large, um, it's a sound studio, but it's big enough to have like a band could fit in it. So all six or eight actors can be in there together. You reach at your own microphone, but you read the script and you're doing it like a radio play. It's like recording an old-fashioned radio play. And there's that interaction between the actors. And whether Susan's opposite me or Mark or whoever it is, um, you get so much energy from the other acting. Acting is about reacting as much as it's about acting. You, you, you give what you get. And if you get something wonderful, it just gives you so much more to work with and to react to. It's hard to react to nothing. Um, you have to sometimes, if the other actor's not particularly good. But hopefully they give you something. And with Susan, or with Mark, uh, uh, John Glover uh, uh, as the Riddler, um, they give you so much. So you get to react. And the recordings, um, the, F the, the recording studios uh, got the, the word got out pretty quickly that it was a great show to do and these were fun bookings So Andrea said she had no trouble Getting any actor she wanted to she could get anybody in there, but Susan was great because she has this very, you know, sultry I mean, it's orgasmic just listening to her talk, you know, I mean she just sounds like sex, you know what I mean and um, So she would give this really sexy reading to Wonder Woman and um, That was fun you know, kind of wake you up. You know? <laughs> not a bad way to make a paycheck. Not right? a bad day, not a bad day. <laughs> I've got just a couple more for you and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Taking us back in time a little bit, you mentioned having gone to Juilliard. Uh, we've, we've talked about this uh, before, but I, I, I never resist the opportunity to bring this up. You were almost roommates with Superman Christopher Reeve. <laughs> Christopher was two years ahead of me at Juilliard. He's a little bit older and um, he, when I was in the first year, he was in the third year. 
Um, I was there at an amazing time. I was 17 when I went to Juilliard. So I was, I was pretty young. And um, my parents had broken up, the family had dissolved, the house was sold, so I kind of had to get out on my own. So I moved into New York, I auditioned for Juilliard, I got a full scholarship, uh, I got my first apartment, but I was 6'2", and I had a really deep voice, so no one really ever asked, how old are you anyway? <laughs> I was getting away with a lot, and I was 17. Um, my first job in New York was as a, as a mail boy, pushing a mail cart that was through a private mail service through the businesses, and I did it in the summer before I went to Juilliard to make money, and I was 16! So I had to get a special work permit because I was too young to do this. But no one ever questioned that I was doing it because I was big and I had this deep voice. So anyway, uh, I go to Juilliard, I'm 17, so I'm a bit younger than everybody else. And um, my roommate was Robin Williams. Um, but Robin... Everybody's heard of this yeah, guy, right? I mean, yeah. Robin was 22. He'd already been through college. Uh, most of the people had, had, had some post-high school schooling. And um, so it was like, you know, he was having these tortured relationships with women, and I was popping pimples in the bathroom, you know? We were just at different levels of our lives. You know? So um, he was like having a wonderful older brother, a crazy wonderful older brother. And uh, Christopher was there at the same time. He and Robin were very close friends because they were of an age. They were closer in age. And um, Christopher, uh, and right out of school, he got a soap opera. And then right after that, he got a play on Broadway, A Matter of Gravity, and then he got Superman. Superman happened within a couple of years of getting out of Juilliard. And from then on, it was just, you know, he took off. Uh, and Robin got Mork right after school. Uh, so he just took off right away. I stayed in New York and did a lot more theater. And we got a bunch of people up at the microphone, yeah? Great. Which side are we gonna go? Let, I think we gotta go to Bat Dad first. Hi, Kevin, this is a huge honor to be able to ask you a question. I've been watching you since I was her size. Wow. And now, now I'm getting my kids into the original animated series. Warner Brothers, thanks you. Yeah, I, yeah right. I, I can't wait for the Blu-ray to come out. I, I'm going to be picking. That it up looks incredible. Fast. It looks so beautiful. Um, two things. One's a question. One's a, a comment. I've just wanted to thank you for giving comic book fans a voice that they could really latch on to oh, and associate you. with Batman, thank because you. you get to read all of the hurt and the pain, but you never got a voice behind it that really emphasized that Thank until you. you came along. And my question is, in your opinion, who is, other than yourself, obviously, who is the greatest um, live action Batman and why? Oh man, that's, that's, that's a dangerous bit of ground to tread on. I mean, yeah, that's the, dangerous territory. the secret let me, society let me, of Batman yeah, might let be me, Let me touch on the first aspect of what you said about uh, playing the role and bringing uh, life to his pain and his uh, drama, deep drama. I was really serviced so well by the scripts they wrote. Bruce Tim, the whole approach that Bruce had with Eric Radomski and then uh, Paul Dini who got involved yeah. was never to do a kid's show. It was never to be uh, they never condescended to the audience. Yeah. And they never condescended to the material. They respected the audience and they respected the material. And that's why when you look at it now as an adult, I look back at these shows and I think, this still looks so new. This still looks so fresh because it was always created to appeal to people on many different levels. There is something there for kids of 10 but there's also something there for people of 60. You know what I mean? It's, it's just lots of different levels. And so I was encouraged. In, 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 in fact, I was pushed by Andrea to be as genuine and sincere, to go to the depths of my emotions, to really pull something up. There's a scene in Mask of the Phantasm where 
Bruce has made this vow to his parents to avenge their, their deaths, and he spends his life avenging their deaths. But he falls in love with Andrea Beaumont. He suddenly realizes this is what life is about. Life isn't about vengeance. Life is about love. It's about sharing it with someone. And it, his eyes are open to this. And he, but he, he knows he can't do it. He can't be a part of that life unless he gets released from his vow to his parents. So there's a scene at his grave, at their grave, where he's asking them. And playing that scene, I was just transported back to images of scenes I had with my father. And I had a really, really troubled relationship with my father. He was a difficult, angry uh, drunk. He was a mean man. And we had a really rough time. And I had a lot of anxiety in me about all of that. And it just came up as I was doing this scene and I was pleading with them. And it was as if I was pleading with my father. And at that moment, this flock of uh, bats comes screeching out of the earth and it pulls him back down to his fate. And he realizes he can't be released from his vow. And after I finished performing the scene, Andrea, said, okay, everybody take a break. She came into the recording studio and she just held me. And we just held each other for a while. She said, I don't know where you went right now, but that was great. And there were moments like that during bookings where people were giving really full out performances in there and I'd watch it. I'd go, I'd watch Mark go crazy, crazy. And you'd think, no one can see these performances but they can hear them. And it's why the show resonates with people. Because we were really giving full out performances in there. Yeah. But it, it's what you're touching on about the, the level of uh, emotion we were all going through in all these things. Um, and that's why she chose, I think, so many actors who had a theater background. Um, uh, why Andrea chose people from the theater. Uh, so anyway. But I don't have a, a, a favorite on camera. It'd be like me asking you, who, who's your favorite child? <laughs> well, and I hope you wouldn't answer that. that. I hope to God you would not answer that. Because <laughs> um, even if that's the only one for now, there might be another one. There might be another that. down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Video yeah. Of this on you the never internet. know. Um, but, the, you know, I, I, it's an interesting question because traditionally the studios pick one person to be their um, sort of uh, image of a role. There's one guy doing Spider-Man, there's one guy doing whatever. And they, they would, uh, that would become the face of the like trademark for the show. Mm -hmm. um, Johnny Weissmuller was Superman, was uh, Tarzan, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so when they first recast Michael Keaton after doing the first one, I thought, well, this is crazy. I thought he was gonna do all of them. Why are they recasting it? And, because I'm a Michael Keaton fan, I think he's a wonderful actor. Um, he he's, a, he's a great actor. He is the best. And, uh, but then when I saw each actor doing it so differently, um, I thought, wow, this is kind of brilliant. Because you see how different it is. I mean, Christian Bale is really different than Michael Keaton in the role. Uh, but his, especially his Bruce Wayne is fantastic. He's perfect. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, each, each actor was, would bring more and more. Ben Affleck was really wonderful in both roles of Batman and, and Bruce Wayne. But, but each person has brought something unique to it. It's like, I th to me, Mark Hamill is the Joker. He is the Joker. There's yeah. no question. Yeah. There's no question. He's just the Joker. If you could be in the booth with him, you know, he's like, Ew. Daddy, you know, <laughs> and he's like, I, it's like there's spit coming at me. I mean, it's just crazy. But then I saw Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger's not better than Mark, but he's just a whole different school of crazy, you know? <laughs> he's wonderful, wonderful. Um, so I love seeing different actors do the same role because it, it just brings different life to it. Um, 
So I wouldn't make a choice of who my favorite live action Batman is. Fair enough. Can you say I am Batman just once? <laughs> just, just for the fan guys I here. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. Yeah! Hey, Ricardo. Hi. Uh, my name's Charles. Uh, I have to say, I haven't watched too much of Batman myself, but my friends over Out. there... Ouch! <laughs> I've seen the and I loved your Leave voice. Leave, buy the Blu-ray, come back. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I love, I've watched clips, and it's, I love your voice. Thank you, thank amazing. you. Amazing. Uh, on the subject before of, there's multiple different ways to say I love you, another one is I know, after all, because... You know, Star Wars, everything. I know, I made a terrible Han Solo joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, on another note of a different way to say that, my friend Liam over there, he's too lazy to come up and stand. So, uh, uh, could you say, I am the goddamn Batman for me, please? <laughs> I, the bat -bat I am the goddamn Batman. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Hi. Huge fan. But Thank you. If you could pick one Batman villain, who would be your favorite? Well, it's well, like picking a live action Batman. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't help but really love Joker because, uh, because of Mark, but also because I really think kind of Joker defines Batman and Batman defines Joker. I think the two of them are kind of the yin and the yang of each other. As evil as Joker is, Batman is that good. And that's what's so wonderful about the Killing Joke movie, because the, the whole question in the Killing Joke is, how far can you push a good man until he becomes evil? Can you push a good man so far, does it take just one bad day, really bad day, for someone to go to the dark side, for someone to become evil? And, and, and it's perfect for Joker to be the one pushing Batman to that bad day. And it's left hanging at the end of the movie. You don't know. They leave it up to you to decide. Um, so he's, to me, the yin to Batman's yang. Um, but the, 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 the hidden weapon to all the Batman shows are the villains, because they're the real characters. They're the wonderful characters. Um, the whole show Gotham that's on TV now, the reason it takes Batman to his childhood, it's not so much about young Bruce Wayne, it's about all those incredible, the, the birth of all those insane villains, you know? Um, I love Mr. Freeze because uh, Michael Ansara's performance, he's such a wonderful actor, and he was so, um, deep in his emotions when he would uh, uh, speak of Nora. Oh, my Nora. And he gave such beautiful performances uh, in Sub-Zero. If you haven't seen it, it's a great movie. Um, so, it's really impossible to pick. Harley Quinn, I love, like all of you do, because she's just so crazy. Um, and John Glover as the Riddler. I've known John for 40 years. We've been acting on the stage together in a lot of things. So I used to get a great joy in working with John. So it's just, it's hard to pick, you know, which one. But I have a special thing with the Joker because of Mark. Okay? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Hi there, Kevin. Hi. Um, my name's Jonathan, and I'm a huge fan. I was sadly born in 98, and I grew up with the Justice League show, though. But um, I just gotta say, two of my favorite episodes are, like, always ingrained in my mind. is the one where you're sitting down with Ace, and she finds out she is dying. And it's just, the emotion you brought to that scene was so wonderful. I just Thank wanted to you, tell you that. so much. Thank and, you. And um, another one was the scene where Batman has to save Diana because she got turned into a pig by Cersei. And you have to sing, <laughs> uh, I am blue. I just got to ask. Am I blue? <laughs> <laughs> I just got to ask, um, how did that aspect come up, though? 
because like it seems a little bit out of nowhere, out of left field in some way. I mean, did they prepare you for that, or it's, was it no, when you saw it? On it's the page? out of left field because Andrea knows that I sing and I love to sing, and she thought we've never used Kevin singing in the show, and she said that to Bruce, and she said he said, well, there's a good reason we've never used to singing because Batman doesn't sing. <laughs> She said, well, how can we make him? How can we put him in a situation that he has to sing? So they came up with that idea that, that he makes a, uh, a wager with Cersei and that he loses the wager. And he, so it's a debt that he has to pay. So he has to sing. So they thought, what song would Batman sing? Oh, perfect, Am I Blue, you know? <laughs> There was a time I was her only one, but now I'm the sad and lonely one, lonely. <laughs> Kevin. It's um, hard to sing at 11 in the morning, let me tell you. Hello, Kevin. Uh, big Hi. fan of you. Um, so in the episode of Ben and Beyond, uh, Rebirth Part 1, when Terry discovered the Batcave, when he was touching the Batsuit, how did you get there and whack him with a uh, cane? How did I what? Okay, in the episode of Ben and Beyond, yeah. Rebirth Part 1, when you, when you fell asleep, when Terry discovered the, the Batcave, when he goes downstairs and he's... <sighs> He says all the all the bat suits uh -huh. like from the original Batman one uh -huh. to the, to the, the first one and the fifth row was the Batman Beyond suit. Where he tries to touch it and then he and then Bruce Wayne whacks him back oh, to yeah. the head. Yeah. How did you wake up so so fast? <laughs> how, do you, how do you do those those weird sounds? You know those the the you know things that aren't necessarily dialogue that are more well, reactions and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. All the oh, I have a great story. <laughs> there's um, there's uh, uh, it's slightly related to what you're what you're asking. Um, all those extraneous noises we make. There's because it was a show that had to appeal to children as well as adults. There's something called standards and practices in the states, and standards and practices says there are certain rules you can't break. For children, you can't use four-letter words. Obviously, you can't ever endanger the life of a child on camera. You can't show death, at least in the 90s. You couldn't, and have it be okay for children. So in Batman, someone would fall out of a 50-story building. You know, ah, uh, uh. there was always what we called the "stay alive" groan. So you know the guy wasn't dead, right? So I would do this, I had to do the stay alive groan a lot because Batman's falling out of things all the time. They're like, ah, oh. So once I was doing it and I landed on the ground and I went, oh, oh, Andrea. <laughs> because of Andrea Romana. And the studio, the place just fell apart. I turned the stay alive groan into like post orgasmic bliss. So it got to be a thing. Every time Batman would have a stay alive groan, Andrea would say, and then you say, <laughs> that's it, Andrea. So at the Christmas party that year, she had put a reel together of all the Andreas from the stay alive groan. It was like, Andrea, Andrea, Andrea. <laughs> but, um, but no, they, 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 they do those takes a million times to get it just right. Those are the things that are actually the hardest to get right. Those reaction sounds, those um, things that you would think would be so easy to get right. Sometimes you have to go over and over and over and over to get it just right. Yeah, no, Kevin, this, uh, this grunt doesn't sound like you're reprimanding Terry enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it, it is, it is, it's a funny balance. Um, and then they have a whole library of them that they keep, uh, that they can re reference to. So, 
that would have taken a number of takes to get that just right. Sir. Hi. Thank you. Over here. Hi. I uh, just wanted to ask, besides obviously the Joker being one of your favorites, is there any reoccurring characters that the, uh, the storyline was so compelling that you would have perhaps loved the opportunity to play maybe as an outside opportunity of kind of see playing Batman? My favorite episode was called uh, Perchance to Dream, and it's where Batman is drugged um, uh, by the Riddler, I think it is. Is it the Riddler? So Mad, Mad Hatter. Hatter. Mad Hatter. Yeah, I was about to say. Mad Close, Hatter. But Sorry. And, um, Different fancy hat. Yeah, another yeah. hat. And uh, that was Roddy McDowell, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, he goes back into his childhood when he's drugged. And he... So I did the voice of Batman and Bruce Wayne. And then I did young Bruce Wayne. And then I did uh, drugged Batman. And then I did Thomas Wayne, the father. And I had scenes with myself as young Bruce Wayne and Thomas Wayne. So I was doing five voices in the same episode. And they each had to be believably related but distinct. So there were subtle differences in the voices. Um, actors just love to be challenged. And that was a real challenging one for me to do. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Um, um, so that, that episode with, uh, with the Mad Hatter, I really enjoyed. And, uh, I would love to have done more with Roddy McDowell. It would have been a lot of fun. Thank you. Sure. Over here. Hey, Kevin. Hi. Let's just swap the topic over to the video games for a sec. Uh-huh. So Arkham City is one of my favorite games ever, uh -huh. and it really introduced me to the Batman. Uh, do you have any plans to do another Arkham game? No! no? So, Kevin, how much do you like um, <laughs> getting paid? <laughs> Let me tell you something. As much fun as acting in the shows is, doing the video games is like Root Canal. <laughs> no, think about it. You're in a booth, you're with six or eight other actors. In two hours, you do a show. It's done. You go home. You, ju you just have a script for a half hour thing. Yeah, you thing. just have a, a script. They give it to you the night before. You're reading the script. You prepare your performance. You go in. You do a, a two-hour booking. And the show's done. In the games, they give you the sides. You never see the entire thing because it's being built over years. Arkham Knight took two years to record. Two years. 37,000 lines of dialogue. I didn't even know how it was going to end when I started it. I didn't have a clue. And the same with Arkham City and Arkham Asylum. You, you sort of venture into it. They give you like a, a brief sketch. Oh, he's going to get trapped in Arkham Asylum and he has to fight his way out. You don't know what's going to happen because there are so many different avenues the character can go down depending on how it's played. And because it's all built to go into a computer, because of the algorithms, it all has to be completely separate. Every soundtrack has to be completely separate. So you can't do it with the other actors. So you are alone in the booth. So you're alone in a booth, keeping the Batman, you know, the voice, keeping the Batman voice alive, keeping the character alive. And then in the situation, they go, okay, now, uh, uh, you know, Joker's got you around the neck. <clears throat> you know, okay, now, uh, you say, uh, you want uh, the Joker to get out, um, he's coming at you with a knife, and you gotta give him a say, get out! Great, that's great, now give us three readings. Get out! Okay, now give us another one, uh, and give it a little irony. <laughs> get out. <laughs> we love it, we love it. We love the irony, keep the irony, and give it a little smile. Irony and a smile? Yeah, 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 it'll be great. Get out. <laughs> and you do this three different takes each time, and they do it line after line after line after line after line after line. You do it for four hours. You're sweating, you're trying to keep the character alive, and then you get an hour lunch, and then you go back and you do four hours more. And it's all you. And Arkham Knight, I'm telling you, it was 37,000 lines. So for two years, I did that. 
which is why they did Arkham Origins with none of the original cast in it, because they were afraid they were going to lose the audience. They wanted to give a game, you know, so we didn't even know Arkham Origins was being done. The people who did the, the major three trilogy. Um, you know, doing the games, when you see it at the end, and it's your voice and your performance, you're so proud to be a part of it. You know what I mean? But the process of building it, I, as I say, it's kind of like going to the dentist. It's really unpleasant. <laughs> it's not as much fun as acting with the other actors, you know. Um, I mean, imagine some days it's you go in there for a day full of work and it's nothing but grunts and fight sounds. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because think of the games, how they play. Someone's just, uh, uh, you know. Um, it doesn't sound like you're falling from a height of 10 feet, Kevin. Try it again. <laughs> it's crazy. Doing the games is crazy. Thank you. Sure. Over here. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Kyle, and I was wondering, uh, how much fun did you have recording the killer joke? Oh. oh, you know, that's did a you, good question. Did you get to do that with no, Mark? No, it's the one time I worked with Mark that we didn't get to work together. Oh. It's like he Isn't was off crazy? on an island in Ireland making a Star Wars movie or something. He was in Ireland doing uh, Star Wars. Oh. And it's the one time, and you would never know it. Whenever I tell people that, they go, you're kidding. It sounds like you're, you're right at each other. Because we know each other so well at this point, we knew. He knew what I was going to do, and I knew what he was going to do. And I was jealous that he got to do a Broadway production, and I didn't, you know. I said, where's my production number? Um, uh, no, that's such a good question. It's interesting. If that had happened 20 years ago, we probably wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, but because we both know each other so well now, and we knew what the other was going to do, uh, we were able to do it completely remotely. Um, but because of his production schedule, we couldn't do it together. Isn't that interesting? Thank you. Sure. Now, that was that was one, if I can ask a little follow-up, that was one that people had been asking you guys for years, when are you doing Killing Joke? When are yeah. you doing Killing Joke? And something that I know that you're asked every time you're up on one of these stages is, you know, what's next? What, uh, you know, what, what can you do? And, and I know that contractually, there's only so much that you can say. But as you've had so much time to have, have Batman nerd Mark Hamill in your ear going, oh, Kevin, I can't wait until we do this one. Yeah. Are there any in particular that you're really eager to sink your teeth into oh, in theory? God. Yeah, they're wonderful. Oh, man. Of course there are. I can't. Different producers um, choose different people that they like to work with. Um, and it's not a financial thing. Everyone gets basically the same. Um, fee. But uh, Bruce Tim um, and Alan Burnett are, are the people who will always choose me. So if they get a project, like they got The Killing Joke or they got the Harley Quinn movie, uh, they'll choose me. Um, if another producer gets um, Hush or like Batman Superman, the, the Death of Superman, the recent one, um, they will choose another actor. Just because, it's just personal choice. It has nothing to do with um, my not being available. I'm there. I'd be happy to do it. It's just, uh, it's just a personal choice of that producer. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of them I'd love to do. But Bruce Tim, unfortunately, is kind of... He's not really looking for a lot more Batman stuff to do. He's looking for other things. Um, and Alan Burnett... Uh, is he, sort of, he recently retired, some right? Sort of retired. Sort of. He says he's retired. I don't believe it. I, I don't, I'll, I'll believe it when he's I see too him. Young. Actually he's retired. too young to retire, but he says he's retired. So, um, so we'll see. I love the fact that I was asked to do the Harley Quinn movie uh, and the um, Killing Joke. But I don't know. There is a series called Justice League Action that has been on. I don't know if it's here in Canada. Is it? Yeah. Uh, which is a great show. It's a lot of fun. It's got a great cast. Um, they did a, a one season which got great reviews and everyone loved, but they haven't ordered a second season yet, but they didn't cancel it, but they didn't order more. So they have everyone kind of waiting in limbo. No one knows. Uh, but I have a new character I've done uh, for Nickelodeon. I can't tell you what it is because they haven't announced it yet, but it's a different, totally different. 2019. It's a different, total character. The, the whole season is done and he's the villain. Oh. And it's 
It's a fun, crazy character. So vaguely, we can probably expect to hear something at least in 2019. Yeah, yeah there'll be other stuff. All right, let's go over here. We've got about 10 minutes left. I think we can Hi. get to everybody. Hi, Kevin. Hi. It's so nice to uh, finally see you. Great. Um, you've been my childhood. Ever since I was a kid, I watched Batman, the anim animated series. That's great. But I'm a big fan of the games. Uh -huh. um, I'm still trying to work through New Game Plus on Arkham Knight. Uh -huh. But um, I was wondering, did you have to do anything different with the character compared to Batman, the, the animated series? You know, people ask that. They ask how he's changed over time. And I think the question is more appropriate. How do you keep him consistent over so much time? Because you guys are the most faithful audience and the most passionate audience. Uh, for this character. He brings something out in people. And if I was to lie, or phone it in, or not really genuinely perform, you would hear it in a second. I think you can hear a lie a lot faster than you can see someone lying. I think you can tell, personally, I think. You can hear someone lying to you. And so for me, the trick has been to keep it consistent. To keep that, that passion, that, that dark, that rooted dark sound of the character rooted in that childhood pain and to keep it fresh. And my theater experience I think really helps me with that. Because when you have to do a show eight times a week, every night, it's not the eighth time the audience has seen it, it's the first time they've seen it. So each show has to be the first time you've done it. So each night, you've got to figure out a way to make it new. And each time you go into the studio, you've got to figure out how to make your performance that moment be new, be the first time you did it. The first time Batman's burst through that door, you know what I mean? Um, so for me, the challenge has been to keep it consistent and, and new at the same time, and fresh at the same time. So for the games, even though it's a totally, it's a much darker Batman, it's a much darker universe, um, his soul is the same soul, it's the same guy. Right. That's why when people first tuned it in and they heard my voice with it, they went, yeah, that's the guy we know. Right. Because they know him, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, he touches something in people at a very deep level all animation does because you're 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 talking to people's imaginations yeah. and you live in their imagination mm -hmm. but batman particularly because he's such a dark damaged person he really touches people uh, on, on a lot of levels yeah. and i i have people come up to me at comic cons the reason i love to do comic cons is because it's the one time you get to interact with the audience yeah. when you're working in a booth you never get that feedback that you do in the theater and I've had people come up to me and say, I just want to hold you. I just want to hug you because I've <laughs> known you for 27 years yeah. and I've never had a chance to show you what you've done for me. Yeah. And they just hold me. I had a woman in Chicago say, you don't understand. Everyone, I grew up on the South Side in the projects. Everyone I grew up with is either dead or in jail. She said, everyone. But I'm not, I got out because I had you every afternoon. You were teaching me the right right and wrong. And I get that from a lot of people. Have, people don't realize how hard life is for a lot of kids, I think. And a lot of people have incredibly challenged lives. Yeah. And Batman is like a safe harbor um, and a learning, uh, kind of nurturing harbor. Mm -hmm. um, so I get that from a lot of the audience. Right. So for me, the challenge has been to keep that fresh, to right. keep it alive. Excellent, thank you. Sure. Kevin, we're running short of time. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, can we rapid fire through yeah. you folks and make sure we get everybody at the microphone? Let's go Hi. over here. Hi. You're wearing a, a Luna shirt from Sailor Moon? Yeah. Tsukini kawate o shiokyo, go for it. <laughs> um, I just had to say that like, you were my first experience with Batman and it's an honor to meet you. Thank you. And I was just wondering, if, what were your favorite experiences working with Mark Hamill? <laughs> uh, my favorite is... 
It's just, he's so, he's so much fun. He's like that great brother, you know? Um, he's such a great guy. There's no um, bull, there's no ego. He's just there to have a good time. And he gives and he gives and he gives. Um, I can't say enough about how much I enjoy working with Mark. He's a great guy. But thank you. Keep up the good work. Sure. Thank you so much. Right here. Hi. I was just wondering, uh, what was like the difference of playing older Bruce and younger Bruce, and like from like an actor's perspective? Well, it's really the temper, the timber of the voice. He just as he got older, you know, old Bruce Wayne, Batman Beyond. It just got, it just got really much gravelier, gravelier, <laughs> and deeper. But also the pace of the character um, slowed down which is why he had to have Terry take over for him. He's still got the fire in him. He's still passionate. He's just physically knows that he doesn't have the, uh, the ability anymore to do what he was doing. So for me, it was uh, as much as it was the, the, the timber of an old Bruce, it was the timing of old Bruce. You know what I mean? He just slowed down. So that, that was the difference for me. Cool. Sure. I've got a good news sandwich for you. Good news, bad news, and good news. Good news is, this has been great, right? Yeah. Okay. Bad news is, this is the last question we have time for. Oh, no. But the good news is that you're here the rest of the afternoon. I'm here all day. So if you haven't gone to see him, go and see him and, and have your personal audience with His Majesty Batman. Ah. Last question. It's good, right? Okay. Yeah. It's really good. Where can we see you perform in theater because you come from that background? <laughs> I haven't done a play in years, I'm ashamed to say. The last play I did was the last play that Arthur Miller wrote and directed um, off-Broadway. I worked with Arthur Miller. Isn't that amazing? Um, which, and which show I was happened that? to, it was a play called The Last Yankee and it was off yeah. Broadway. And the reason that Arthur ended up taking over directing was because a wonderful director named Joseph Chaikin, who was from the Open Theater, a famous director, had had a stroke and he developed aphasia and it was very difficult for him to, to communicate. Um, so Arthur had to come in and uh, sort of work with Joe. Uh, and I was playing The Last Yankee, I was playing the lead character. and. I mean, I was, it was like a dream come true, you know? I'm working with Arthur Miller on his last play, you know? It was amazing. So, but no, I haven't done a play in years. Thank you. Thank you. So to but I should. Up, to wrap things up, Kevin, uh, what have you enjoyed most about being in Vancouver? It's, it's a beautiful town, beautiful weather, wonderful it's so food. beautiful, and from what I understand, I've gotten the only three days of sun you people ever get. <laughs> And I so appreciate that. No, really, the, everybody, you are a wonderful, wonderful community. Uh, everybody's been so warm, I gotta tell you. It's a great city. Well, as your, as your fellow American, thank you for not being afraid to be a little bit political on social media uh, for the right reasons and the right things. Man, it's a dangerous time in my country, I tell you. Thank you for being the Batman that we all want and need, sure. especially in this sure. time. Thank you. Let's hear it one more time for Kevin Conroy. Up next at 12.15, we've got Jaleel White, the voice of Sonic the Hedgehog, and maybe you've seen one or two episodes of Family Matters over the years. Uh, Steve Urkel himself will be right here on stage with us. 1.30, we've got Will Beaton. 2.45, uh, 